Hello, welcome to the fourth webinar in this series, uh, exploring leading health organizations efforts to assess and address social needs that impact health. This webinar features a conversation about Kaiser Permanente's effort to develop a standard approach to addressing social needs for its members by connecting them to community resources and tracking outcomes. My name is Marie Hubbard and I'm the program manager for the California Improvement Network or CIN. For those of you that aren't familiar, CIN is a network of quality improvement leaders focused on innovation in healthcare. It's a program funded by the California Healthcare Foundation and administered by Health Force Center at UCSF. A few logistical reminders before we get started. Everybody will be on mute for the remainder of this hour. If you would like to ask a question, please put it into the Q&A box at the bottom uh, panel of your screen. You may also use the chat function if you're more familiar with that. Um, we will be recording this webinar and sharing it with the network um, within the coming weeks. Uh, please uh, share this resource widely with your networks. Now I'm going to introduce our facilitator and our speaker. Um, as facilitator, we have April Watson, Director of Practice Transformation at California Quality Collaborative, and also one of CIN's managing partners. Um, and then we have Sarita Mohante as our presenter. She's Vice President of Care Coordination for Medicaid and Vulnerable Populations at Kaiser Permanente National, and also one of our partner leads for CIN. So I'll now pass it off to you, April, to kick us off. Great. Thanks so much, Marie. Um, you can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. So thank you everyone for joining and I'm really excited about continuing this conversation around uh, social needs programs and meeting social needs of um, patients and, um, and specifically around the return on investment and how we think about that um, as different types of organizations providing care. Uh, in California or supporting organizations who do that. Um, so it's definitely my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Sarita Mohanty. And um, so she, uh, Marie mentioned her title and she directs the national efforts um, across Kaiser Permanente to identify the leading care coordination and care delivery models um, and facilitates the spread of those um, in all regions and states where Kaiser Permanente operates. And so she is the accountable executive for the development and implementation of Thrive Local, which we're gonna be learning a lot more about um, during this webinar. Um, so the way this will work as it, it, as it has on others, um, if you've joined in the past, is um, Sarita will be presenting some information and she'll pause at different points. I'll probably um, uh, offer a question that uh, might go a little deeper on what she's just said. And while I do that, or even while she's talking, if you have questions that come up, please feel free to put those in the Q&A um, that Marie will be monitoring. So Marie can also chime in with questions that you have. So we'll do our best to get through all of them. And I'll also, um, as facilitator, just offer some of my own questions as we go along. So Sarita, I'm gonna turn over to you. Why don't you go ahead and get started? Wonderful. Um, I hope everyone, you can hear me okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pleasure to, to be part of this um, this afternoon. Um, and uh, thank you to the CIN and to April for facilitating today's discussion. I'm really excited actually, because this is gonna be an interactive um, and engaged um, conversation versus you know having me present um, a number of slides. So I'm really excited about that. And I look forward to your thoughts and feedback and questions. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and launch right in. Um, today, I'm going to be speaking um, specifically um, about our efforts around what we're calling Thrive Local. And we'll get into more detail during the presentation about what Thrive Local is. But it is really it, and a part, and I would say somewhat of a foundation of our Kaiser Permanente Social Health Program. And um, so with that, I mean, I, I like to um, make sure, next slide, there we go, um, that, um, you know, recognizing why we're moving um, in this path to, down this path to um, address social needs and social determinants of health. It's because, you know, Kaiser Permanente is part of our mission is committed to providing what we call high quality, affordable healthcare services um, and it really to improve the total health, I would say, of our 12.4 million members, as well as the 68 million individuals that reside in the communities Kaiser Permanente serve. So um, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, 
why, you know, when we think about health, we're not just talking about the clinical, we're, we're also addressing uh, beyond the clinical, the, the social, the behavioral, and that's going to be, you're going to hear this kind of pervasive or throughout the, the presentation. Uh, this just shares with you, um, shows with where we are located geographically. Um, you can see that we are in eight regions and the District of Columbia, um, and we, you know, own a number of hospitals and medical clinics, but we also do contract. And part of this effort, as I mentioned, the 68 million are in the, those are the communities in which we reside. That's what I'm referencing um, for this slide. You know, one of the things in terms of background, I really, I mean, I like to address kind of why are we doing this? What are we trying to solve? And it's really interesting because um, in the organization, you know, or, or even I think in other systems, um, there's been this misperception that, oh, social needs really is about Medicaid or low income pop, you know, uh, the, the dual eligible populations. And, you know, so we did some analysis at Kaiser Permanente where we recognized that many of our KP members were struggling, not just, I mean, of course, our Medicaid, by virtue of the fact that they're low income, um, they had disproportionate uh, social needs, um, health-related social needs. But um, we found that nearly 30% of members, um, our KP members, had incomes at or below the 250% federal poverty level. And that equates to about, roughly, if you look at the federal poverty level, um, level limits, it's about, 30,000 30, or so per year for a single person and about 63,000 for a family of four. And that was based on 2018 estimates. So that equates for us about 3.4 million members. And importantly, over 50% were members in the commercial line of business. So then recognizing for us, us organizationally that, again, this is not, um, this, is, this is for all our, um, addressing the needs of all, all our members. Um, when we think about our approaches to social health. And this slide um, really, uh, we, one of the things we were trying to understand was, you know, um, the public's perception about and experiences um, in the areas um, and the impact of unmet social needs. And so this, this is a, a um, some data on a survey that we did um, that we helped um, kind of set forth. It was a nationally representative online panel um, used to generate responses of adults. Uh, we had about 4,000 respondents um, over um, across the United States. And basically what we found um, overarching was that 68% of those individuals reported that they had an unmet social need um, at least at some point in the past year. And, um, and if you look at these statistics, you can see, for example, one in four Americans have had an unmet social need that they say was a barrier to health in the past year, 21% prioritize paying for food or rent, overseeing a doctor and or paying for medication. 17% lack transportation and couldn't pick up, go to the doctor or pick up their medications. Um, and 9% indicated lack of housing. So what this really um, emphasizes to us is that, um, you know, all Americans, you know, need access to social services. It gets to our prior slide that we're not, you know, we're looking at all our members um, we did see just in the analysis that low-income members, when we did oversample them or looked at the ones at or below the 138% federal poverty limit, had disproportionately higher needs, and like it was up to 90% had one or more unmet social needs. But and that being said, we have a lot of um, opportunity to support all our members in this in this, um, in this area. So I like to also, you know, take you to a, um, an individual, a patient of ours that, um, you know, is a, is a great example of how, um, you know, we, what we see in day in and day out and how our approaches to address the total health or social health of our members is really critical. And so if you look at Carl, um, you know, he is this individual recently divorced, diagnosed with diabetes, um, missed, his, missed his first follow-up appointment with this Kaiser Permanente primary care provider. So subsequently gets admitted um, to the emergency department for diabetic complications. He goes to this primary care visit and they um, eventually, and his identified goal of controlling diabetes and losing weight, so those goals were identified, but then he's admitted to the emergency department again and diagnosed now with depression. He's referred to care management. Um, and when the care management team tries to reach him, his phone is disconnected and they're unable to reach him. 
And then he becomes also a no-show for his next primary care provider visit. Now he's admitted to the emergency department for chest pain, has morbid obesity, cardiovascular disease. There is a social worker who helps Carl arrange for transportation for his follow-up appointments. Nevertheless, and unfortunately, Carl's health spirals, causing him to lose his job. He continues to be severely depressed. He's isolated himself and misses several um, Kaiser Permanente appointments. He's deemed, quote, non-compliant and is dropped from the care management program. So here is an example of Carl, and, and, and we've seen so many stories, as many of you have, of situations like Carl, where we really do need, really think about how we could, um, what could we have done differently? How could we have made better impacts that go above and beyond we recognize the clinical? So we also, you know, really, and one, one slide also to, to reflect on why focus on social needs is there are definitely um, market factors, but there are also internal Kaiser Permanente factors that influence our, our, our desire, our, 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 and our approach to addressing social health. Um, definitely market factors have played a big role. Um, Medicare sustainability, you know, as we're thinking about initiatives to, um, given the, the reimbursement rates declining and the complexities and the, the growth of an aging population, how do we think about um, the, the social impacts on these members and think about it and, and think about how our care model needs to evolve for, for Medicare members as an example. Um, definitely there are state and CMS regulations. I think many of you may be aware that there is now an opportunity for plans to bid for uh, Medicare supplemental payments um, or benefits to, um, to include services that can address social determinants of health. Um, if a plan so desired, they could offer air conditioners to members. And so that is something that is, um, you know, kind of along uh, coming more and more, more and more the provisions in um, regulations are emerging. Um, there's also just emerging evidence um, as more and more low-income people gain access to healthcare coverage, um, really trying to determine what um, interventions are, are more cost-effective in addressing their social needs and total health. Um, I, I mentioned EPIC enhancements. EPIC is our electronic health record at Kaiser Permanente and is, is, is um, electronic health record for many systems. And there are definitely enhancements underway to, uh, they have something called, the, for example, the coordinated care management module, which is um, uh, some evolving and um, is sort of in it involves uh, a social health um, a module that will allow you, know, you to track and monitor how your, um, your, what the social needs are and how those impact your care plans for members and patients. And then value-based payment uh, models, they're just, Changes in the um, and the healthcare payment models are pushing um, some forward-looking systems to look at effective ways to address payment patient social needs. Um, and then in KP's land, I think you know we just recognize we're in eight regions. We're, we we had no standardized approach across our regions. Uh, we tended to focus on the social needs more on a reactive versus a proactive and a system, again a system, lack of a systematic approach. Uh, again, more medicalized focus on medical needs. Uh, really um, not real. there was definitely opportunity to think about how we bridge our connections outside of the four walls of our organization. Um, KP staff were not empowered. They didn't know what to do if they did assess or identify a social need, how to connect people to those services. And then, you know, we have in our community benefit space, a lot of community um, support, um, um, efforts that we um, help sponsor or fund, but we really weren't partnering as closely with communities as we felt we could. There was, again, that opportunity. So, uh, um, so there, those are some of the things that I, I think are really important to, to recognize as we think about, you know, as we, now I will talk a little bit about the work that we're working on. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in here, Sarita, real quick, because I want to pause and see um, if there's questions, but I'll, I'll um, ask one, which is, I, I'm curious about, the, the leadership journey that's maybe happened and, um, you know, what did those conversations look like among key leaders and how did, how, how did you kind of get agreement to elevate this to be such a big strategic priority across, you know, such a big organization? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. And, um, and it's, it's complex and, and it took time, as you can imagine, but I think, I think fundamentally there was a recognition at at Kaiser Permanente, given our model and our mission, 
that you know we really wanted to look at and really address the total health of our members and patients and community. And you know we we started in the 30s and 40s. If if you know some of the history of KP and the shipyards and you know Richmond and Portland and Washington and you know we we went in under this prepayment model, which was one of the first in the country and. In that, it was it, we had to start to focus not just on illness and injury, but also on prevention and wellness and safety. So it, we had some foundation about looking beyond just the acute and and just and that's the sick, but really thinking about prevention. So we see this as a, an extension of prevention, um, really about you know how we become more upstream and how we address those factors that impact health. And we know that social and environmental factors influence up to you know 40 percent of the total health of members i think you know the other thing just very briefly is um you know our um we have a number of community health investments that we do through our community benefit program one example is like resilience in um, schools and school environments and i think there was well, how do we start as with our own members who, who would benefit from some of these efforts and programs how do how do we start to bridge between operations and, and community. Um, so those are some of the things. And then the KP factors that I listed are some of the reasons why leadership really felt we needed to go down this journey, um, this path. And, and so just the heightened recognition of all of these market and internal KP factors really influenced leadership's decision to, to push this forward. That's great, thank you. Marie, are there any questions that have come through in the Q&A? Yeah, there has been one question. Um, so Sarita, before you started talking about um, the patient, Carl, you were explaining mm -hmm. some statistics about understanding kind of the needs of the patients um, or members of KP. And if, I'm just, there are a few questions about um, better understanding kind of what approaches did KP take to get that data and um, what tools or vendors did you use um, to analyze those needs of the members? So you're talking about examples like Carl, or are you talking about more kind of just system, just understanding kind of more broadly what the needs are, correct? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's that's the question. Correct. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and I and I would say that that's still emerging in terms of how do we synthesize. I mean, you know, one thing is as an integrated system, KP, we have a lot of data, <laughs> and then, and the question really then becomes how do we coalesce that data and really start to understand uh, and you know, and so we have segmentation models, um, for example, that help us identify the high risk, and now we're starting to look at the rising risk, um, and then the ones that are more like low risk or stable. Um, so we, we, we continually look at those um, in, in our organization to help us identify who are the, the individuals we should be approaching or prioritizing. Um, the challenge has been that I, I would say that in our organization, we don't have a standardized approach across the whole organization. We have them in pockets and I think that that is just by the nature of how we're or you know structured in terms of regions but I think there there is now and then I'll talk a little bit about this um, is that part of our kind of social health approach that we're embarking on uh, collectively is really working towards that getting those data um, and those tool you know tools set up so we can look at you know these and identify those patients even more effectively I think one of the areas that we're also working on is figuring out which data to use that's external to our electronic health record or our claim system um, you know and uh, there's and a lot of other organizations could probably speak to this who are probably on this call to, to talk about you know how they're partnering with maybe vendors we have not um, you know there's some some exploration of vendors who provide external data um, where, where we're exploring those organizationally um, to see what data might be the most useful but Currently, we rely heavily on our own internal data to help us understand our members. So hopefully that answers the question. That question is a little bit vague, but we're, we're, we're working on it, I guess I should say, is the, the short answer. Great, thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I did wanna just mention um, very briefly uh, about the social needs among the subgroups of our KP members. Um, we did some analysis, um, actually, we have a, an, or, an entity within Kaiser Permanente called SONNET, which is the Social Needs Network for Evaluation and Translation, and they did a, a scanning a cert, you know, of, of um, social needs around uh, certain subgroups, and you can see that you know, we found that um, food insecurity, 29% uh, of our high utilizers in given geographies, when they looked at them, had some level of food insecurity. 25% of elderly Medicaid members, 
um, also had some level of food insecurity. Housing, um, our high utilizers across the regions range from 11 to 23% in terms of housing concerns. And then if you look at our dual Medicare, Medicaid eligible population, which is 34% had transportation challenges or needs. Now, of course, this does not reflect our total membership. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at this, these approaches around social health, not just of the highest you know, utilizers, but more systematically, how do we think about addressing social needs as they emerge for our members. But I think this gives us an idea about you know, some of the things that we are doing in, in terms of interventions to address these. You know, we, we would want to make sure that we, we start to look at some of these subpopulations. It's really about population health and, and, and focus on these um, critical um, groups. So that's, that gives you some kind of um, some of the latest analysis that also helps substantiate our need to, to, to move in this space. So this slide um, really then starts to get into kind of the, what the what Kaiser Permanente is really doing, and it gets and it kind of probably addresses some of the question, Marie, that you brought up, uh, which is a really about um, creating a social health program and what have we done to date? Are we contracting with vendors? What does this look like? And we will talk about a vendor we are contracting with for Thrive Local in about a minute, but. First and foremost, just kind of holistically, if you look at the social health program we're, 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 we're trying to build, and this is enterprise-wide, it's really starting to look at how kind of four critical components, identification, connection, information, optimization. So identification, um, really, how do we assess and, uh, those social needs um, that, could, that can, they can be identified by KP staff, provider, member, caregiver, or community partner? Some of that might be secondary data, it could be through claims, through um, encounters, um, and, and you know, by zip code, you know, just proxies that you, help you identify where the social needs may be more um, prevalent. Um, and we're also starting to ask more um, systematically, what are the social needs of our members and patients? And so one example, just very briefly, is looking at how do we do that within our own electronic health record, EPIC, uh, which we call KP Health Connect. And we're looking at um, EPIC's version of what they call the social needs, um, EPIC's out of the box social needs assessment tool. And um, there, are some, there are some some questions that are asked that we're gonna be um, likely asking our, you know, across KP that you should use this as a base of social needs questions so that it will sit in one place we can look at information across the organization and compare and then look at how those um, how we're addressing those needs um, as a whole and what are, what are we learning from that um, experience so that's some example of identification um, that is um, that is being worked on currently the connection piece is where we're going to talk about thrive local really network um, locates resources from KMKP community organizations and the government to meet those needs that are identified and then really importantly is getting that information. So one thing we lack, we recognize, is we didn't have information to even know if we've made a connection. Because right now our social workers, nurses, navigators in, across our organization are, are trying to connect people to services if they identify needs. The challenge is, is that they sometimes they will give a handout to the member or patient, say here's some information, or they might call the, uh, the, the organization, but we don't have that information coming back to us whether the loop was closed and this is where there's such an opportunity to really look at information and track those recent referrals with community partners and we'll talk more about that and then the optimization one one thing we really want to ensure is as we get these data um, back on what we're doing if we're processing referrals are we getting it, closing the loops understanding how what kind of impacts that's that's making on clinical outcomes, efficiency, um, on um, satisfaction and unaffordability, and, and also how it's impacting our community. Um, you know, this is again, this is not a KP play alone, this is a community partnership. So how do we think about the, you know, how, uh, how we would work collectively to improve the conditions of the community once we get those data? So this is a, um, a holistic view, and then I will, um, you know, but I'll pause there, see if there's any questions I can, Otherwise, go into Thrive Local and talk a little bit about what we're doing in that space. Yeah, Marie, I'll just turn to you. I don't have a question at this point, but but I, I think there might be a couple in the Q&A. Yeah, there are. Um, so, Sarita, you had mentioned um, referring to your high, sorry, high utilizers. Can you mm -hmm. 
explain how you identify and define your high utilizers? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I don't know how I just went back. But um, uh, yeah, so the high utilizers in this, they, they varied. Um, and again, I, it goes back to the earlier question, Marie, that you asked, or the, the, somebody from the uh, participant pool asked. It's, um, you know, high utilizers, there are different or, um, regions, and depending on their workflow, have developed segmentation algorithms. So sometimes a high, a high utilizer in, in one setting, for example, reflected those that had high emergency department and inpatient utilization. Um, with some complexity score that was related to the chronicity or complexity of their medical condition. Um, many of these, I think, I don't think any of those ones, the high utilizers really looked at, um, um, at uh, social risk factors in, in any detail. It was mostly, mostly on utilization uh, factors that, that impacted whether they were high utilizer or not. So the readmission rates, things of like that. All right, so so let me now talk to you about Thrive Local and um, and just give you context. Um, Thrive Local is um, our approach to really address the, the 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 social health of our members, patients, and community. And this is um, um, the the framework of this that we going back to kind of why we kind of explained why we wanted to do this, but really it was executive leadership that said. Um, let's let's really approach this from an enterprise-wide you know, level. And um, so what we did is we did it, you know, just to give to give you some background, we did a, a deep assessment, and this has been going on for years. This is, doesn't happen overnight. We we actually um, uh, really tried to figure out, you know, what does this want, what does this look like? Do we build? Do we buy? Um, you know, we had to go through a number of questions. What, what does our governance structure look like, our executive sponsorship? So we went through this whole journey. Um, we ended up deciding that we wanted to con contract with a vendor to help us with this Thrive Local work. And uh, we did, went, then went through an RFI and RFP, and we did select a vendor. Um, the vendor is uh, called Unite Us, and they are a New York-based um, company that is a technology company that um, prov provides a care coordination um, module that helps um, you know, clients connect to community-based organizations, social services, but they also help uh, clients like Kaiser Permanente help build um, a, what I would say uh, community partner networks, and we'll talk about this and what that means. So there are three components to Thrive Local that I, I to, that I want to describe. One is the resource directory, and what that is the, um, the that's where we actually started. We wanted a platform where we could curate all the community-based and government program information into a single source of truth. We could search and filter for those resources based on a person's geography, or gender, race, ethnicity, and we needed those resources updated regularly by the contracted vendor. In this case, Unite Us will be doing this. Um, so they will be manning that platform and that's that database for us. And we will now have the opportunity to go into that database and search for those services. However, as we were looking at this, we realized, recognized that that was not enough. To be able to look up services, important, but how do we actually then get to the next point, which is the community partner networks? How do we establish bi-directional communication, coordination, workflows, between our referral and refers and, and, and the community. And so this is where um, Unite Us also will help us in um, establishing these community partner networks. These are, we'll call, these are geographically based um, networks. Um, we, have, we have estimated approximately 39 within our KP geography based on service area or county. And basically what Unite Us is going to do is uh, work network by network in a phased approach to get um, our um, the work with the community-based organizations and with KP to um, engage those community-based organizations to get on the on the Unite Us platform. So that way, now I'm looking at the resource directory and I find a service. I, versus now I can I would call the service or give a paper, piece of paper or email or text that information to the member or patient. I can now submit a referral directly through the system to the community-based organization. And that community-based organization who was on the platform would receive it, and we would be able to then have that exchange of whether a service was, um, was met, um, where, where, where individuals got that service or not. Another nice thing about the community partner network 
um, approach is that they, um, the, the community, let's, let's say for example, as a social worker, I refer to a um, community-based organization focused on housing. And that, then that um, housing agency re um, receives that referral, but then identifies two or three additional needs and wants to refer to another community-based organization, that, that can also be achieved through this platform um, if that CBO is on the, on the, on the platform. So it's, what you're really seeing is a development of a, um, an ecosystem of community-based organizations and, and systems like Kaiser Permanente, all kind of really getting line of sight of what's, what's happening with our member and patient and really making sure we're not being redundant, that we're not, we're, that we're really recognizing the, the, the needs of our, our members and having that information um, for us as we're developing care plans, et cetera. So that's really the, um, the community partner network approach and KP users will send and track referrals through this mechanism, as I mentioned. The final piece, which is really important, um, is also the technology. You know, as, as mentioned earlier, we are collectively on, on, in KP on, on one electronic health record called EPIC, or we call it KP Health Connect. And so it's really important for us to figure out how to integrate our electronic health record with the Unite Us platform. So we are working on that piece where as part of our launch, it is making certain that if I am a clinician or staff person in our EPIC and our electronic health record, I would have a seamless way to access the Unite Us platform to, to look up those resources and make those referrals. Again, having that bi-directional exchange of information that with the information event coming back to our platform and we do, our plan is to integrate it more over time, I mean, more and more with our, with, with KP Health Connect, but also at, um, in, in contract year two and beyond, we will actually start to work on having it on our member portal, which we call kp.org, so members and, and their families could actually use it as a self-service tool as well. So um, that's, that's the, uh, kind of the, the summary of what Thrive Local is, and I will go into a little more detail on the timeline and so forth. But any questions um, that have come up, Marie or April, any questions about our Thrive Local approach? Yeah, so I have a question. Um, just thinking about probably the wide variety of, uh, you know, types of groups and delivery systems maybe participating in this webinar. I'm curious for those that maybe aren't as large and kind of integrated as Kaiser Permanente, or, or example, not on, you know, maybe they're not on the same EHR, what do you think might need to look different about a social needs program model that you've just described um, for for those types of organizations? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, in one aspect, you know, we have you know we are on this one on this kind of epic you know like KP Health Connect platform. Um, that being said, you know, we still have to have an ability to connect you know, outside of, of, you know, of the four walls of, of our organization, as I mentioned, we're not gonna be successful in addressing total health unless we do that. And so um, in my mind for organizations that may not all be on a single EHR, you know, there still needs to be that conduit um, between whatever system you have, might be a health, a community information exchange, health information exchange, um, but, but you wanna be able to have essentially a, um, a single source of, of information and truth to be able to, because fundamentally this whole approach that I'm describing is part of our care coordination and case management efforts for our members and patients, right? And, and, and we wanna be able to have single care plans. We wanna have, be able to know who's on the care team. So if, it's, um, if something's very clinically focused, you could say, okay, there's the nurse and the physician and, you know, but, but when it gets to social health, you wanna be able to understand who um, on the community on the community-based organization side is part of that care team? Who's addressing the needs of the of the member and patient? And having that um, ability is really important. So I think you know it could be a, a third party like we're using um, with Unite Us to help us be that conduit. Um, and I would say it's similar. It really is. You know, at the end of the day, this this approach is really enabling your workflows, right? So as you build your workflows between your system and the community. You, you want to have this uh, some kind of enabling system to help help it make it make it as seamless as possible. Thank you, okay. Marie. Are there any questions that have come up? Yeah, there's a, a few questions um, around uh, the use of Unite Us and just mm -hmm. um, working with your patients. So, 
the first question is around um, capacity of these community-based organizations. Is there a way for them to communicate back with you um, to share their capacity for accepting mm -hmm. new referrals, whether they're able to or not? Yeah, it's a, yeah, absolutely. And I, 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 this question comes up, I think, regularly, and it, and it should. I think it's a really critical question. Um, so first and foremost, um, one of the roles of Unite Us as they're seeing us, you know, as the, the, the referral process is underway is recognizing um, when referrals are being processed and when they're not. Um, obviously working um, with the community-based organizations to assess if, let's say as an example, I'm, I'm um, in a clinic and I'm making, you know, I made 10 referrals to a particular community-based organization and none of them have been processed, recognizing, well, what does that mean? Is it because there's something systematically that's going on or that they lack the capacity and we would need to understand that. And I think that will, that will, that will help us understand, you know, again, it's getting about partnership with those community-based organizations to say, what are those capacity constraints? And, and then how do we think down the road, um, not, you know, but organizationally KP, but also other systems deliver you know, payers and providers. How do we think about addressing um, capacity, you know, if that really, if, and but we need, you know, having those data to to help us understand that will be so critical. Because right now we're doing the referrals, as I said, we're doing those referrals, but we're not seeing whether we're what we're doing in terms of impacts or referrals being processed or not. We don't have that line of sight. So there's there there's that's going to be really um, and and so this whole approach as we move forward will be absolutely in co-design with our community partners and other key stakeholders because. It won't be successful otherwise. Okay. Um, so this this slide really talks about the timeline, and one of the things I just like to mention is that this is a what we're calling a phased deployment. So um, we do um, intend there's been a real desire to at least have at minimum that left box that I described earlier, the resource directory populated for all our regions, and Unite Us would be working with us on that through the, the first year of, um, through for our eight regions and the District of Columbia, as I mentioned. Now the community partner network to launch, which is the piece I told you, which is you know, going network by network and getting um, community-based organizations to be on the platform and, and have that you know, training and, and making sure that they understand how to use the platform, but also making sure that it's integrated with any information systems that they have. Um, that's going to take time, and so what we've been, we've planned is in the first year of our of our um, of our um, work, we're going to start with just four networks within KP's, um, and we're starting with the with our northwest region, which is Portland and South um, South Washington, um, and um, we are sorry, yeah, so Oregon and Southwest Southwest Washington, and then um, we're going to go to Southern California, Northern California, and and that'll be our first year. What we intend with that phase deployment approach is really starting to learn what this means, what it looks like, are people even using the tool, what is that, you know, what is the uptick, how many loops, one of the first outcomes we're going to look at is are we closing those gaps, um, so we'll be doing that, and then once we learn and we iterate our approach, then we will do a much, um, we, we, we feel we will be ready to do a much more rapid scale, and that's what you see through 2022. As I said, we have, we've estimated approximately 39 community partner networks in our geography. And then the IT integrations are gonna be phased as well. As I said, it's a, it's a, it's a roadmap. Um, it doesn't happen overnight, but we do wanna ensure that we make it as seamless for our members and our, and our staff and clinicians as they go, as they do this, um, as they use the uh, tool and, and make those. So um, these are, this is um, an important, important slide for us because for us it's really critical as I've alluded to but how do we really measure success here and um, you know we we want to measure a lot of things here and I think it's really important we've kind of categorized some desired outcomes but the one that's really going to probably be our initial um, you know kind of focus um, for at least the first year or so will be the closer social closure of social care gaps and that's really you know I mean even process wise looking at Use, using the tool, the approach, making those connections, but then seeing how many referrals and then whether the social needs were met. Again, closing that loop. We do want to start to look at specific populations, subpopulations about 
you know, are we improving hemoglobin A1C for food insecure diabetics, et cetera, you know, asthma control for those living in poor quality housing. So we will have that ability to start to delve in as we scale to really to understand if we're making some kind of measure, a measurement or a successful um, impacts. Personal health and well-being, um, enhanced system performance are, is also another key area, and that gets into we'll, we'll speak to kind of the ROI, you know, at some, you know, looking at also utilization, efficiency, but also how do we um, improve not only um, our, you know, staff but provide an overall provider satisfaction and retention. That is really important in terms of we 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 really hypothesize that this work will enhance system performance for us organizationally. And then community health, we recognizing that we have to be able to demonstrate over time how are the data that we talked about and that information, how is that going to lead to improved neighborhood level measures of health, reductions in inequities, health inequities, and you know, even how do we start to think about financial sustainability or performance or um, of community-based organizations? So we're really just going to start to um, measure those over time. Again, it's not going to happen overnight, but these are definitely clear intentions as we as we go forward. So this slide um, really, I think, you know, gets to the heart of the kind of calculating the ROI. Um, you know, and really, it's looking at savings over investment, right? When we think about ROI, um, kind of real, and we can talk a little bit about what really ROI means, but in, in, in the standard language, it's really about, you know, cost and, 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 and so forth. But let's, let, me, let me walk you through how we, we, had, we built our business case. And we had to build a business case for Thrive Local. It was, you know, the, our, our national CFO, the regional CFOs all asked, that we, we recognize, you know, if we're putting all these expenses in, what kind of benefits are we achieving here? So um, I've listed, you know, some of the IT expenses, you know, vendor fees, program management, technology, security risk, architecture, integration, data solution, et cetera. That, um, you know, it, it also includes what we're investing up front versus what's going to be maintained and ongoing. So those are all being fact are factored into our business case. Next, you know, it's also but what we call the non-IT expenses of the business. This is really around program management, managing the, the contract, the vendor, the, the approach, how are we ensuring that it's standardized across our organization, training, evaluation, that last slide, um, we've set up a framework and funding to support an evaluation of, the, of this approach. Um, analytics, you know, what is this, how do we get the data back? Where does it sit in our organization? How can people access it? You know, what do those tables look like, et cetera? That, there's a, a lot, a large body of work that needs to happen around the analytics. Um, redeployment of staff, you know, um, what does that mean when you're telling, a, when a region is gonna use Thrive Local? What, how are they gonna, you know, take the existing staff and care coordination and now have to use a new tool? Right, and what does that look like? And so, um, you know, there's we, we, we anticipate there's going to be some cost impacts in terms of when you redeploy staff. What does that mean? We put contingency and then same investment and ongoing expense. The soft benefits are also really important. Um, you know, those inc include we hypothesize that we will improve um, or increase staff clinician effic efficiency. You know, right now, sticky notes, SharePoint sites, Excel spreadsheets to to, to capture all the social or community-based resource information is not efficient. And so this was asked by staff and clinicians that we wanted this approach, this tool, uh, to be able to look up services and, and refer. I think there's also gonna be benefits around the regulatory requirements. As I mentioned, you know, there are, up, there are emerging uh, regulatory requirements uh, underway. We wanna avoid duplicative solutions across organizations. So hence we went with an enterprise-wide contract and approach. Um, satisfaction, um, patient satisfaction, staff clinician satisfaction. So these are some of the things that we are working on. And then on the hard benefit side, um, that is, um, you know, was difficult to project, I will admit, um, to uh, difficult to project because there's still little research and evidence, you know, if you, to really quantify the impacts. I mean, we looked at, for example, there was a Pruitt study by WellCare on Medicaid and Medicare beneficiaries that looked saw some reduction or impacts on total cost if you connect people to social services. You know, so we looked at those kind of studies. We looked at um, some of the internal work that we had done in certain regions to help us determine, you know, assuming a reduction in per member per month um, cost for low-income populations, 
if at least one need is met. So we made a projection um, and, and we made a phased in kind of benefit realization since we know we're not rolling it out all at once. What does that look like over time, over regions? So that's how we um, essentially calculated our ROI um, business and our business case. And I think, you know, we, we anticipate, you know, a, a net present value kind of positive positivity sometime in the next few, three, four years. It's not going to happen overnight, as we know. And we had to socialize this quite extensively with our, our leadership and our chief financial officers. So I'll, I'll pause there and see if folks have any thoughts or questions about how we approach this. So I think we do have a couple of questions and just kind of tagging onto that very last point you were making, Sarit, I'm curious about, you know, the financial cycles in healthcare are so short compared mm -hmm. to a, pro a program of this type where um, any kind of uh, impact that you realize, whether that be social or financial, really takes quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. So you talked about kind of socializing that. So I'm just curious about how how did how was that like tolerance or patience created around knowing that like these financial gains are not going to be the same as you know other types of programs yeah i mean it, it is i mean you know because i think you know you're, you're you know these kind of investments are new and okay. they they don't have the as, as i mentioned in that first bullet on the right hand side you know really difficult to quantify and you can make some you know hypotheses and some projections so it was it was a lot of socializing as you as you reference or I reference as well you know talking to the regional chief financial officers our national to say this is going to take time and 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 there's going to be other benefits in addition that we recognize are part of our mission are part of our our, our operational imperatives you know it's it's also there's a financial affordability component that we we cannot let you know we have to recognize but it's also about healthy days or healthy year, life years. It's also about um, making sure that we, we do have member and provider experience that are improved efficiencies that are those soft benefits. So we, we, we kind of looked at this more holistically and recognize that. And, and, and I think in leadership, I think the key to this is making sure from that you have that, that leadership and sponsorship from the top who says, yes, we are, we are recognizing this is going to take time and we're willing to learn and we need to have a learning environment approach to this. We can't, and we know we're going to have to iterate pretty rapidly as we go forth. So that was, that was the approach we took and, you know, having a national governance to make sure that they could provide input along the way was also. So Marie, I think, I think there's some questions that have come through, right? Yes, there are. Right. Yeah. Um, so you had talked, Sarita, a little bit about um, kind of meeting social, the meeting the social needs, and how have you, in conversations, Kaiser, kind of defined when a social need is met, um, knowing that that's you know broader than just closing a referral or accessing, you know, giving patients access to community-based resources. How have you guys had more broad conversations about what that means to meet a social need? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, kind of, I think initially we, we at least said we want to ensure that um, that one that they they did get the service if we're really trying to, we, we feel we've identified a need and that that need could be met by a community based organization, for example, ensuring that that service was obtained. Now, that being said, we, we also want to recognize um, you know, and, and that's where we part of our evaluation, at least in the first year or two was going to be around um, qualitative, um, understanding qualitatively interviews um, of members, of community-based organizations, of our staff, do we truly meet those needs? And, um, and what does that mean to a patient? Like they may have gotten the service, but did it make any difference to them in terms of their, how they, how they perceive their health? I think that is gonna be really a piece that we can't, we can't avoid, you know, we, we, we have to recognize. And so that's gonna be a, a one part. Um, so a lot of, qual qualitative um, you know aspects quantitative as I mentioned you know looking at the, the journey of an individual a high utilizer for example uh, who may who be maybe continuing to spiral like Carl was and then um, seeing if you're if you're starting to address those social needs do does he get out of that downward spiral does he start to and and, and really tracking that that journey um, it's it's gonna it's it's again it's not simple but we that's how we start to look at it and you know at some point we do want to have 
to the extent right now we, we, we don't have any kind of match controlled or, or controlled studies um, to evaluate this, but over time as the sample size gets larger, I think we would start to really want to look at, you know, control groups and as we're phasing in this drive local. So we'll have more data and I'm sure a lot more people will have data and I hope we can collectively share this, these learnings with one another. Um, so I, I, I think we're kind of closing towards the end. I, I really just wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, you know, we see, you know, go back to Carl and if we look at his path and we said, okay, so now if we had these capabilities, how would we have helped Carl in this situation? So in this case, you know, when it gets back to that social, that, that, that social health program approach, identification, connection, information, optimization, you know, we were really, um, and it's, you know, it's, with this approach, looking at predictive analytics and segmentation, we want to be able to systematically have algorithms that flag Carl for social needs screening based on his divorce and address change, for example. Um, then Carl is screened, he's food insecure and has social isolation, and they're their high, highest priority needs, not only, you know, that, that are really identified by him as high priority needs. So a care manager, social worker, navigator can um, use the Thrive Local resource platform to look, find a church-based uh, food pantry or where Carl can volunteer and receive support, as an example. Um, and we, we leverage that partnership and, and work with the community, um, having bi-directional exchange of information, developing the workflows for referral and management, and then looking at, as we, as we get more information, as I mentioned earlier, how do we think about uh, future investments to support those uh, community-based organizations where capacity is constrained? And, and I, I know that's going to happen. We know that you know, there, there, there's resource constraints. So that's going to be part of that real partnership um, that's noted there. And then closing the loop using the IT platform, data exchange, and with the contracted food pantry in this situation, KP can see that Carl's at least social um, service needs were met. And you know, if we see Carl will be healthier, he'll work as a chef, his involvement with his church has helped him to stave off depression, keeps him active, and while he's slightly overweight, his diabetes is under control because he's dealt with his transportation and other challenges that kept him from going to see his, his doctor as well. So that's the, the, the Carl, um, you know, kind of we think how the capabilities to really support uh, individuals like Carl. And I know folks on this um, webinar know, have seen these situations um, more often than they would want. Um, and so the last thing I, I like I like to, I wanted to make sure is that, you know, going back to when we think about ROI, when we think about addressing social determinants of health and health related social needs within our organization, making sure it was really critical and it gets to your earlier question, April, the work we're doing, it has to align with the organizational strategic objectives. And that was really important. Um, so it has, you know, how does it impact our, our Medicare sustainability, our quality initiatives, our, our member, you know, uh, you know, thinking about staff, staff, um, and, you know, uh, this satisfaction or member satisfaction, things like that. So, um, and community health, we have strong core strategic objectives around community health. So aligning this work with our community health priorities are all are really critical. The other piece is that we recognize that we're not gonna be successful without co-designing this along the way. Um, and we did this before, but we wanna make sure that as we build these interventions, we work closely with our, with, with Unite Us, with the, with the, uh, with the community-based organizations and other key agencies, even other systems, even competitors who are in the same space to really say, we're all working with the same community, how do we work? collectively. And that's really part of our approach to as we're going into markets in our, in our own geographies, how do we partner with other systems. Continuous monitoring of performance using metrics to evaluate improve interventions. That's going to be um, that's part of our approach. Um, developing and constantly managing those partnerships, whether it's with our vendor, Unite Us, which is a strategic partnership, or with, um, with uh, the community-based organizations. And also, when you design these interventions, you need kind of clear timelines and clear criteria for scare, scale. And so we're, we have developed, started, and, and we're, as we're, we're looking at this approach, and I mentioned we're having a slow phased approach in, in year one, we would be able to see, okay, we're ready to now effectively scale. We, we know that we've ironed out the kinks, we've, things that people are using the tool, and we're at a point where scale makes sense for us organizationally. Um, and then recognizing that the financial incentive states, providers, community-based organizations, 
et cetera, are not aligned. And, and, and I think we really feel that by doing this work, we can inform um, broader policy and, and you know, um, state at the state and national level about how they're thinking about um, systems addressing social determinants of health. So, um, and that, you know, and a lot of work around provider value-based contracts, alternative payment models, risk adjustment are underway. So we want to help inform those approaches. So with that, I, I, I think that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any, I know we have about five minutes, but any questions or comments or feedback, I, I think the more, um, and I'm always happy if there's questions after this, please don't hesitate to reach out because as I said, this is gonna be a collaborative approach as we go forward. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Sarita, I really appreciate it. I, there are a number of questions that have come through, so I, um, I'm sure we won't have time to get to all of them, but thanks for that offer to connect um, after because what we can do is kind of compile those questions and share them. Um, so Marie, I'll turn it to you. I think we probably have time for one, maybe. We'll, we'll see how, how time goes. Um, yeah, so there's one, uh, well, there's a number of questions, like April said, but uh, one question that uh, we haven't really touched on, but um, kind of focuses more on this uh, return on investment, mm -hmm. uh, which is when, you know, you're thinking about the patients at Kaiser who are Medicaid enrolled patients um, and who may start to utilize these uh, community benefit, uh, these community-based organization services. Uh, what have you or others at Kaiser thought about if this initiative will then not show any return on investment, given that many of the patients who will benefit from those services will then no longer be enrolled um, in Medicaid services. So, so from the Medicaid lens, if they're not enrolled in Medicaid, because there's, there's a lot of churn, I think is what the question may be alluding to. I mean, again, yes, I mean, maybe for, so one of the things we, because we are also a commercial plan and we are a Medicare plan, we, we, we anticipate or hope that the member, if they, let's say, let's say they become, they get a job and they now are eligible for commercial level insurance that they would stay with Kaiser Permanente and they, we would continue to man, you know, so we believe that actually as part of this approach, we could, we, we would get that return, whether they're a Medicaid member, a Medicare member, or, a, you know, a commercial member. So, um, but that being said, I mean, I, we, we're again, not, when we think about return on investment, which we didn't calculate in that business case per se for the members, but broader as we monitor how it's impacting community, we want to, we, we think that regardless of, let's say the member doesn't continue to be with Kaiser in one year from now, but if, if that person's health is improved and it, it impacts the total health of communities, then that's a win. So that's a, I know, um, kind of an audacious goal, but that's where we, we, we envision um, community health impacts. You know, we think we can help build some of those community level health impacts. And just one, I saw one kind of request come through, so I don't know if this could be something possible as a follow-up, but there was a request to share the screening questions that are in the social risk screening tool. So if that's possible, I don't know if we could do that as a follow-up. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that okay. shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I, can, I think I focus on my team on this call too, so I'll, I'll make sure we can get those AM questions. Um, you know, I think that I mentioned that I know the Epic, um, has and and you know other there's other you know, prepare and other screening tools that are right. also people are using. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I want to make sure there's only two minutes left. And Marie, I know you have a poll for everyone to evaluate the the call, so I want to uh, be sure we have time to get to that. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for the time. Thank you both so much for um, presenting and facilitating this call and thank you to all of you who uh, took the time out of your day to participate. Um, I did pop up a poll, it should be on your screen and this will just help us better understand um, how we can improve our content to support the work that quality improvement work that you're doing um, at your organizations. Um, as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and uh, we will be sharing the recording in the coming weeks with those on this call, but also with the rest of the California Improvement Network. Um, we're looking forward to having you all on our fifth webinar in this series. Uh, we'll get an update from Contra Costa Health Services, who um, spoke to us about a year ago on the work that they're doing there. Um, and that will be on Tuesday, August 13th from noon to one. The registration is open and is posted on our website at www.chcf.org slash CIN. So thank you all for participating. Thanks so much.